Well, kia ora koutou everyone and uh, thank you for coming uh, along today. Great to uh, see some, some familiar faces and some new faces uh, here as well. My name is Sam Borff, I'm uh, Mayor of Selwyn District. You're in a building at the moment, if there's an emergency, you'll need to deal with it, um, which means we might need to go outside, we may need to just sit where we are for a bit and take instructions from the people that run this place. Uh, if the emergency is personal and nature and you need to use the toilet down the hallway, back towards the entrance and, and hang a left. Um, and if you need tea and coffee at any time or water and refreshments, uh, they're open in the kitchen there. Feel free to um, help yourself this afternoon. Um, tu he e te rangi, tu he e te whenua, tu he e te nāko o nā tangata. Ko te mea nui, ko te aroha, tihei mauri ora. Write it in the sky, write it in the land, write it in the hearts of all people, uh, the greatest thing is love. Uh, and I think that love should be the motivating factor for all the decisions we make in life, whether they're things that we do at home with our family and our children, whether it's what we do professionally with our work uh, and where we spend our time earning money, uh, whether it's the things that we apply our trade um, in on a sports field or working in an individual space or with others, uh, and whether it's interaction with our communities, the places we choose to live and how we treat uh, one another, love should be at, uh, at the centre of that. Uh, and I trust that the decisions you've made over Christmas uh, have made this week and today in coming here have been based um, out of a sense of love and care uh, for one another. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, today to introduce uh, Ming Foon, who's uh, Race Relations uh, Commissioner. Ming, uh, welcome along. Uh, I'm just going to give you a, a wee short bio um, of, of Ming, uh, just so he under, <laughs> just, just so you know who, you, who you've got here. Uh, Ming has been uh, on local government for 24 years, was a mayor for 18 years in Gisborne. Um, was a man of, of great passion. I remember when I was first elected to council, Ming, meeting you as a councillor and just knowing uh, that you, ha you held mana in a room um, of elected members. Uh, mayors from across the country looked up to you and respected you for the work that you've done for Gisborne, but also the work that you've done for, for local government. So thank you for that. Uh, the Human Rights Commission is about promoting respect uh, for human rights, encouraging uh, harmonious race relations, encouraging equal employment, and looks to resolve complaints about discrimination and race-related issues, uh, all through relationship uh, and discussion and dialogue uh, not through courts and abatement notices uh, and some other things that governments and local governments can, can get involved in. Uh, your language skills are exceptional uh, and just you may be sharing some of that with us today, uh, but today I'm obviously of Chinese descent and, and English is here too and I look forward to any Iranian that you may have learned from your daughter-in-law or son-in-law uh, along the way as well. Uh, but this afternoon's a chance to, to hear from me and just so he knows where he's sitting, we're in Selwyn District, uh, a district of about 70,000 people, 22% uh, under the age of 15, and twice that number, oh, sorry, only half that number, over the age of 65. Uh, and so a very young district uh, with a forward-thinking council who's been focused on infrastructure um, a lot, and in the last five or six years has really focused on social infrastructure. Uh, to help people connect with one another and, and get to know who we are. Lincoln University has been a key space uh, in bringing people of all different ethnicities from around the globe into Selwyn uh, to study uh, and we've been able to provide them with housing uh, and places for their kids to hang out so that they can stay and live in New Zealand. Thank you for the greeting, thank you for the prayer that you have. E me ki tākene mihi ki tahu kāinga, uh, te tau mutu ki mātou ki wākene mōhio me ki ngai tau whānui te tū hono hono o mātou ki te ki Ngāti Pōrau mai hamo i te rangi. Actually, ngai tau, tau pōtiki and Pōrau rangi are actually brothers. Kaitau is the younger one, but he had the most land. He did the older one and the wife actually passed um, when Pororangi passed away, I told Portiki we did Pamu Itarangi. And so, Kami, and Miki, Tinano, Tate, Tate, Mate, Huhu, Rato Kufiturangi, Tia, Narate, Waiti, Te, Eninga, Taonga, Tuki, Oma, Tato. Thank you to acknowledge all the people that passed on and that have left their hopes and dreams and they have left their Taonga for us to continue the journey. And so it's a great day, and today is the year of the ox. Mm. Yeah, don't ask me. I'm, I'm born in the year of the pig, right? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, signs or um, zodiac signs actually matter. 
And it actually is quite true because my wife is actually born in the year of the rat. And man, she is very <laughs> meticulous. <laughs> and she actually loves to actually store things away. Right? For, for a rainy day. And she loves her children. And I'm sort of like, oh, okay. Right? Um, but I love people because, you know, pigs have a big litter. And you've got to be able to look after the litter. And so I think. Um, sort of like born into a job sort of thing, but um, yeah, happy Chinese New Year. Gong Hi Fa Choi, which is, there's actually quite a few dialects of Chinese um, right throughout. So my, my parents, I'm just going to talk a little bit about myself, a little bit about the Human Rights Commission, and then I want to actually share with you how we are going to eliminate racism in our country, which is quite actually... You'll be, you might be surprised in how we're actually going to do this because it's not an easy task, right? <laughs> um, so my, whatever it is um, that happens in New Zealand from migrants coming here to refugees to single parents and all that sort of stuff, our family has it. Um, my mum was unfortunately an orphan uh, when she was two and because her parents had separated and none of the mother and father wanted her. Um, so she was brought up by her auntie and lived in Hong Kong. My father's family is a refugee family because of the Japanese invasion and they came to Hong Kong and um, in 1947 they, uh, my dad came to New Zealand. Um, I know that my parents were married in 1958 in late December and I was born in Gisborne 1959 in August, so I was made in Hong Kong <laughs> and born in Brisbane. And also, I, you know, I, I've been. My mother said, "There's your wife, right?" And I said, like, "Okay." Um, so I was um, chosen. My wife was chosen for me, um, which is okay too, because that's how how it is at times. Sometimes I feel that it's not a bad way, actually. Um, but anyway, we've lasted 40 years, and so that's fantastic. We have three beautiful children. Now, my mother said, you're going to marry Chinese, and we imparted that value to our children, and none of it actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> so my oldest daughter, who lives in London, <coughs> her husband is English, Jewish, um, Nordic, Irish and Scottish, as they are. Um, my middle daughter, she lives in London as well, and she is married to a German and French guy. And then my son, whose uh, partner, girlfriend, partner, um, she's Iranian, Croatian, and US. So within one generation, it's strange. <laughs> and that's how quick it can actually happen. It can actually, on a toss of a coin, Salwan district could be like that too. Um, it's actually happening very fast. And so our world is actually made in the bedroom. Or maybe if we re remember back those days, it might have been the beach seat without the gear. So I guess they can win. We are market gardeners and we bought, my parents bought with, with them what they knew. They didn't know anything else. Um, but they worked them hard. And I was a market gardener as well because I was actually quite shy. Um, interestingly enough, we had a veggie shop and I learned Māori. Um, and, and I learned Māori because of my genetics, because I was keen. Seven years old, um, I had my brother and we also had my parents. They didn't take it up. 50% or more of our customers were actually Māori. And we, I just mimic what they said. If they said Kaitaha, which means Kaitaha means how are you in the language of Ngāti Poro, but Kaitaha in Ngaitahu would mean what are you doing? Okay, so there's a big difference, isn't there? And so um, I just mimicked them, you know, they say, oh, Pito or Kapit, and I say, Pito or Kapit, your cabbages are rotten, or in, at home, um, the word for potatoes is uh, Pararekau. And over here could be rewind. 
Okay, so these are differences in um, language. Um, it's interesting that it is Chinese New Year, and I do have a bit of a, a joke sort of thing at the Māori. Um, avocados in Māori are actually called rāopū, okay? And the rāopūru is actually the shape of the avocado. The avocado is actually called rāopū. And rabo is, um, I'll, just, I'll just say, uh, bull bulls. Because they were kind of so I said, happy bull bull years. They were kind of years. That's actually captured, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I entered local government in 1994. And my mate, who was a policeman, Hemi Hikawai, he said, Ming, you will make a great counsellor. And I said, what does it do? We didn't even have a clue. Um, but looking back at it, we actually had a uh, liquor licence, we had a um, fruit and veggie shop, so we had the health and hygiene sort of licence, building consents, resource consents, we had a dog, it had to be registered, and we used to take the dog out and feed it a pill, pill to do it its poos, and they tested that. And so we did have a relationship with the council, um, not knowing to me. Um, but anyway, he said, lunch is good, Dave. And I said, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> now, I did have a thought, right? Being Chinese, I thought, will they elect me? And um, four farmers and myself ran, and I topped the polls. And I worked out from that day that it's actually not about race. It is about what you say, what are you going to do, and a lot of it is about perception. So I played on the perception of that Chinese people were good with money. And ratepayers love to know what their money is going to be used for. Secondly, I could speak Māori, and that um, was helpful for a small part of our community, which is probably about 10% in the rural area. And then the other thing, we were good at business. And so running a council is like being in business. You've got to make sure that um, what you spend on is, has good outcomes and outputs. And also we were good with families. That's a perception, right? And so um, perception is great. And so our, our voters said, yeah, those are, those are great values. Those are the same values that we aspire to as well. And these are the values that we actually practice here in our constituent. When I ran for mayor, um, there were five people running for mayor as well. Now, I have lost twice, not in the election, but one election I stood and I stood for mayor and I lost. And I attribute that to myself, and because I had a big mouth, right? And I just spoke too much, promised too much, over exuberance in my presentations and wasn't bad though because I lost by 350 votes. And I thought, oh, that's pretty good. There was only two of us in the race. And um, the incumbent mayor had been there for nine years. And I said, oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty promising. So I won the next election in 2001. Um, then um, I've always had around about 70 or 80% of the vote, which is fantastic in our district. So. If you ever want to know how popular you are, and I see that councillors, and I acknowledge <laughs> councillors and deputy mayors and chief executives and principals and everyone that's here, you just need to stay for elections. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's a board of trustees, a local community at the bowling club, or anything, or the council, you just need to, if you, one's got an ego, you'll find out <laughs> really quickly. Anyway, um, with the human rights um, job, the race relations job, I actually applied and I lost. Um, and there's a reason why I lost. I wasn't actually concentrating on my CV as such, and I didn't answer the questions like how you would answer them. And um, fortunately for me, somebody who expected to have the job actually went and took the Minister of Justice to court three times. And he said, right, I'm going to start the process again. And then I went on to YouTube and uh, found that 
best CVs in the world, right? And the best CVs in the world came up with an acronym called STAR. Situation, Task, Action, Result. You know about it, huh? Great. And um, so they were asking me about the United Nations um, Sustainable Goals, which is about water and environment and housing and health and education. And so I just chose one, water. And before I said, look, I've read the United Nations Declaration um, uh, on Sustainable Development and I comprehend it, right? But I had, in this instance, in my second one, I gave an example. So wastewater was running into the um, sea. Uh, that's the situation. The task is how we're actually going to fix that. And obviously we apply for resource consent and you're going to save some money. And then we built it and the result has been fantastic. So the Māori of the sea has been restored. Our community's way to it is better. And it wasn't just the Māori community, it was everybody that actually used the sea. And there were few antagonists that used to say, oh look, um, it's too expensive. Um, it's a waste of time, the sea is the best place. And I said, oh well, we'll just cut your pipe off and you deal with the sewage in your section. Oh no, you can't do that. I said, well then chuck it into somebody's um, uh, carpet of kind, uh, someone's food basket, uh, which we all enjoy anyway. Um, another example was the Tiriti of Waitangi. So in the beginning I said, yep, I know the articles, Māori version, English version, and then I thought, oh, actually we're the first council in New Zealand to actually have a situation where Māori wanted to be at the table making decisions, and there's a part 11 in the Resource Management Act that said um, Māori can actually participate at the table to make decisions, and we spoke to Ngāti Porau, and they said, yep, we want to participate. And the, the, um, the result is that they actually are 50% of our resource management um, decision making because they are more concerned about sustainability of their resource. Not about the economic um, resource, but more particularly the land, the water, the streams, the lakes, those sort of things. And I'm, I'm going to say that Māori actually grounds um, um, us as uh, New Zealanders in terms of it's not just for now. And councils are similar. It's not just for now, it's actually for the future generations going ahead. And I look at the wonderful facilities here and it's not just for now. It's for our young people as well. And those are very important um, values which I totally comprehend. And the other thing Māori say, we, we've got nowhere else to go. This is actually our home. And in terms of the Treaty of Waitangi, 100% of Aotearoa is governed by Māori. It's actually not governed by Māori, it's actually governed by each iwi and hapu. So in New Zealand there are hundreds of nations within a nation. And the notion of Māori coming together um, is a tall order because each nation of iwi and hapu, they have their own mana. And that's what the Treaty of Waitangi said, that Māori can look after their own tau. At that time, they had 100%. And then suddenly, within a few years, um, now there's only 4%. And so you can see why the... Um, and especially in high Māori populations, the disparity is uh, reasonably high. But however, if we put that into perspective, there is a lot to celebrate as well. Even though there's a high percentage of Māori um, that are underachieving, there is at least 95% of that population actually achieving. And so it's a narrative that has been um, talked about, and these and stuff and, um, and other medias, mediums of media nowadays, the narrative is actually starting to change. People, are s the newspapers are saying, look, we actually apologise, they're actually putting a wrong lens on it. Because what we say and what we hear and, and read actually creates a stereotype. So Asians are fast drivers, dangerous drivers. 
And when you go to China, they do go, <laughs> right? And so there's the perception. It's actually quite interesting, the um, perception or well, the rhetoric of stereotyping that overseas drivers were more dangerous than the locals. Well, in COVID, there has been no overseas drivers, and yet our accident rate has gone up that way, and they're all locals. And so what we say and what we read and what we hear is very important, and that you as community leaders actually have a huge responsibility in sharing positive stories with your communities. And um, it's great that soon we're going to have history, New Zealand history. Now, New Zealand history is not just confined to Māori history, because right in the South Island here, in the deep, deep south, in Otago, in around about 1864, Māori, uh, Chinese, came here as gold miners. And so we were right in the committee of the Ministry of Education. I said, we want to tell our stories in the curriculum as well. Same as the Indian people that in Pukekohe. You know, as late as 1970, now, apartheid um, was rife in, in some parts of the world, and more particularly in South Africa in the 80s. There was huge protests in terms of the Springbok tour. But in the 1970s, in Pukekohe, there was segregation. You may not know this. Māori were only allowed, Māori Asians and uh, Indian people, they were only allowed in um, certain parts of the theatre. And then they were only used certain parts of the um, toilets, the ablutions, and they were only allowed certain parts of the bus. And so even in our country here, there has been segregation right through, and more particularly to Tangatwhenu. Um, suppression of language and culture and all that. But the tide is turning. The tide is turning. Now, everything has to be deliberate, unfortunately. So there was a big um, issue of not having enough females in positions and boards in high management. And it's been talked about for a long time and not a lot have changed. But the government has made it deliberate that they have the option to put 50% of the boards in female, uh, or females in it and add Māori and Pacific and other ethnicities to boards and they have done that deliberately because if we voluntarily do it, we just talk about it and it's really about activating um, the philosophies that we actually have and the activation of um, the Treaty of Waitangi is actually also important it's, it's about we have more common than we have in difference and I'll just give you an example of common things that we do. So um, there's many denominations that believe in different um, spiritual beliefs that people have. But everyone actually has a different place and a different way of presenting it and attending to it. So you've got your um, pre, um, your English churches that were here and Roman Catholics um, and Church of England and then the new lot that came was the Pentecostal type uh, with played the guitars. Wow, that was a shock to some people. And um, we've had the, uh, the moss that they built just because they look different. Uh, people actually think they shouldn't actually be here. But temples and moss and um, who's been to the Christchurch Buddhist um, temple? That's an awesome place. You know, it's just, it's that variety and, and um, diversity and inclusion that is actually part of our landscape in New Zealand. We can't actually get away from it because it is here and we just have to um, somehow deal with it. Some people still believe that the earth is flat. and doesn't matter what I say, they are still going to say, no, I mean, that earth is flat. And I said, oh, well, one day you'll disappear from this earth and hopefully um, there will be more people that think that the earth is brown. Um, I won't just say where they're going to go because that would be preemptive. <laughs> go. Anyway, um, my job is um, harmonious communities, maintaining and 
in, in enhancing harmonious communities. And I still believe um, face to face is the best. Right? We can have emails and we've had lots of Zooms and Skypes over the last um, year. It's actually been pretty good. You know, we've upgraded our technology, we've downloaded all the apps that we've had, all the different platforms. We know when to go to mute, just make sure you've got my trousers on when I stand up to go to the loo. <laughs> then I turn the video off, and so um, it's been awesome. But it still comes down to our interaction as social beings. Now, it's not that difficult, right? There's some fundamental things in your worship. You mentioned love. I mean, how fundamental that is in terms of knowing it is less because our differences can actually enhance the, um, the decision-making around the table. Now, I remember um, Kate Shepherd and a few ladies, or thousands of ladies, that actually said, look, we should be able to vote. Now, they had to actually convince the majority of men, all the men, because 100% of parliament was actually men, to say, can we actually vote? And they said, yes. And the interesting thing is that they said, yes, but it wasn't until 30, but you weren't allowed to actually have women in parliament. It took another 30 years because before the first lady was actually in parliament. And so it's been quite a journey. It's like um, for disabled people to actually have um, the wider goals and the universal um, design and access and all that sort of stuff. It took able people to actually make sure that that happened. And that's what I'm saying about um, discrimination. It takes the people that are anti-racist to actually stand up for the people, the victims that have been abused. And that's a very powerful thing because by keeping an eye and just watching it, we are not much different to the people that are actually being um, the perpetrators of that. It's not easy, right? Because 35% of our schools, our students, according to ERO, are actually bullied on a daily, weekly basis. That is a lot of kids. That is like 350,000 children out of the 900 odd thousand children that actually go to school. That is horrific. Now I am very pleased um, that the Teachers Council is going to roll out unteach racism. You heard of it? No, it's coming soon. Now, how it works is, is marvellous because the Teachers' Council are the accreditors, the certifiers of the teachers' register and the licences. And you, the, every teacher has to demonstrate that they are unteaching racism according to the guidelines of the Teaching Council. And if, one, if the teachers don't do that, they may not get registered. So it's pretty good stick and carrot. And that is the same thing with the National Action Plan Against Racism. Now we do have um, a few people that um, are persistent, but it's good that, like uh, Banksy and Plunkett and those guys, they are put on notice. Because the customer, the social license of operating nowadays, is totally different and intolerant of what is um, of yesterday. You know, even people, when we talk about um, slave migrant labour, modern slavery, now, you read in the paper often that people in liquor stores, people doing horticulture, agriculture, and some other industries, they are actually exploiting people. And I didn't um, realise how bad it was till nearly every week 
there is a case and people actually find, are fined for that. In actual fact, it should be stronger because I wrote to your worship, not here, but um, lead, uh, your worship, Dalziel, to say that you need to cancel the liquor license of those perpetrators. Mm -hmm. We need to set some examples because there is a test of character in the Liquor Licensing Act in terms of having a liquor license. You've got to be of good character. So when you've been fined, obviously that's naughty. Um, we are working with the government um, often on many pieces of legislation. So pay equity is um, a huge thing, but tra pay transparency is what <coughs> is actually needed because we don't really know. We know that um, Pacific, Māori and Asians are paid less than uh, their Pākehā counterparts. Uh, in fact, Pacific people are actually <coughs> paid around about 20% less doing the same work, same qualifications. Don't know why, but it happens. And so the government is slowly moving towards making sure that there is paid equity and, and it needs to start with the government in the first instance. So I'm hopeful that um, you being the principal, that you actually pay exactly the same as your male counterparts because it wasn't that long that we weren't. And that's, and that's why, you know, why, why is that so? And so um, there's a strong um, lobby uh, from the industry, but also from the Human Rights Commission. Now, if, you want, if we want to put down things as fundamentals, everybody is born human, and we all have human rights. And there are around about 34 that our government has signed up to. You can look at them in the website, and they are very comprehensive, but you have those rights. And I wish, and I'm hoping that when you actually make an issue next time, rather than blame the council or something, and say, this is my human right, that I deserve to actually have a warm home, a warm, safe home. My human right to be paid equally as my counterparts, my human right to be at the right to education and the same resource of education, my right to actually be um, attending, uh, to practice my religious beliefs, my right to do whatever of the other 34 human rights, because they are very powerful in terms of the influence and the right that you actually have. It's very important that you have a look at them and you'll see, oh, environmental rights, you know, even the tree has a right. And so, so I'm, I'm just hopeful that you would um, be cognizant and, and have a look at the website to see what's happening there. We also have the uh, Disabilities Commissioner, Paula Pesarito. She's doing some fantastic work, and her big um, topic is actually, I'll just let you know, 90% of all the complaints that come into the Human Rights Commission are actually half as disabilities of 45, 90%, and the other half is actually racism. Those are the two big items that come through. Now, I don't actually deal with them because we have a mediation service and we have a tribunal service. All those services are free. And the reason why they are free is because they, we want people to have the right to access and not because someone has been more wealthier or a company that's got a lot of money can uh, hire lawyers to combat the issue. We just want a level playing field. Even the tribunal told me that they actually even pay for people's travel, lunch, cup of tea, biscuits, as well as the court case. It could be 300 grand. It's not cheap. But we believe that people do have the right and the access to justice. Now, unfortunately, for the mediation service, it is voluntary. And if one party does not want to participate, then the person that is uh, complaining will still feel aggrieved. 
but you still have the um, Employment Relations Act to actually go through. You can choose. There's a couple of pathways in that. So um, Paula's big thing is actually universal design. And I've always maintained, as the Mayor of Gisborne, I said, look, um, I used to get um, Grey Power come to my office and says, man, the seats are too low. And I said, oh, okay. I didn't know. You know? I didn't know that when you get older, it's actually harder to get out. Right? I know now. <laughs> <laughs> Regal Mortis is a seat in. And so... They said, look, we just need to rise about three or four inches. So we said, well, why don't we build all of our seats that so we don't actually have to have that issue. The other issue was your footpaths are too narrow, men. Um, we've got scooters. We've got prams. We've got um, people walking. We've got cyclists. So why don't we actually make it at least three metres wide? And so all of our pathways in Gisborne are nearly three metres wide. And you know... You don't know till you don't know that people on the on a on the wheelchair. So how do they get up the curb? It's impossible. So I mean, my old headmaster, Pax Kennedy, um, from Mark Baraka School, he said, "Me, I want you to push me around town." And I soon found out that how difficult it was for my old headmaster to get around because he was in a wheelchair, and mate, it was like. Up and get the wheels up. So we we immediately said, let's make this um, gradient slope in all of the intersections. It doesn't matter what it costs. It's nothing. It's it's a matter of the human right of people having accessible um, in the public spaces, in the playgrounds, in the public buildings, and so universal um, access. And for disabilities is huge. You know, you don't actually have to build ste uh, steps. If you build the slope for the wheelchair, everyone can use that. Why do we have to waste money building some more steps for people that want to use steps? You know, it doesn't make sense. Now, after, we've got a, um, a project called, it's called the Nash. The uh, National Action Plan Against Racism. There's got to be a few acronyms here, right? And it's um, for all New Zealanders. It's for all New Zealanders, but the United Nations has this committee called CERD, which is this Committee to Eradicate Racial Discrimination. And in here, the New Zealand government have signed up to it. And so they've signed up to it around about 12 years ago. And I said, well, you've signed up to it. Let's do something about it, right? And so we've spoken, to, so they've actually assigned the MOJ, the Ministry of Justice, to actually do the government part. They've asked the Human Rights Commission um, through the Race Relations Commissioner to actually facilitate the civil society part, which is mostly all of you guys. Now we have two principles, two values, mana and keep it simple. Because no one wants to have a report, and I've read some of these um, action plans around the world, they're 200 pages, hopeless, does nothing. Mana, meaning, and we do it well in local government, that it is ground up, right? And so on our side, we set up a task force which is Tiriti based, which we have um, on our um, task force, and we're here to make decisions. Our ask is from our community, we want a, a piece of policy, we want action, and we want action plan, and we want to publish your stories. So if you, anyone's got stories, you have to sign your life away to allow us to um, publish. So the action and the action plan we want from our community. And we know that there's lots of stakeholders. And we want businesses, Chamber of Commerce, NGOs, 
schools, um, ethnic communities, all to participate. There's thousands of um, groups in Aotearoa. And they all have membership. So once we develop what we're going to ask, we're going to send to our stakeholders, who will send to their members the same piece of paper. Um, and when they answer these questions, they don't have to answer the whole lot. They can, they might only produce a piece of policy. A piece of policy will be simple. I, I expect it to be about one sentence that our organisation will eliminate racism. Simple, right? And, and we want these members to actually send it directly back to the task force. We do not want the um, stakeholders to change or fetter or to filter anything. We want the raw material all to come back to the task force. Now, for the general society, that um, civil society, that everybody in the public that actually doesn't belong to anything, or doesn't want to actually belong to um, these people to know, they could actually, we will send them a note and they can send it back directly to us. Um, there could be 10, 100,000 replies. I've just spoken to the uh, New Zealand Council of Trade Union, they've got 170,000 members, and they said, well, we're keen, right? I'm hoping that your community will be keen too. And so, once we get the response, we will articulate, the task force will articulate the draft policy, the draft actions, and even though there might be 100,000 responses, I don't think there will be more than 15 or 20 actions that will help to eliminate racism. There will be some themes that will come, be coming through. And what will happen is that we will produce a draft, and we're going to send it back to everyone that's actually contributed. And we'll say, what do you reckon? Might need a bit of tweaking. And so we tweak it, and then we will adopt it. And then we publish it. And then we'll flick it over to the government, the Ministry of um, On this side, they've got um, TPK, Te uh, Ministry of Pacific Peoples, of Office of Ethnic Communities, and to Arafiti, this team of task force is to deal with the whole of government. Ministry of Transport, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, Department of Conservation, and so on and so forth. And by publishing what the community feels, ensures that the government doesn't hide anything that may not be what they want. How it's going to be rolled out is the trick, right? How's it going to be rolled out? So, who's fam you familiar with GETS? Mm -hmm. This is the government's electronic tendering service, right? This is like the Health and Safety Act. And so if, say for all suppliers to government and local government, they have to have a health and safety policy for all suppliers and, and, and people and organisations that wish to actually provide goods and services to the government and local government, they will have to have adopted this, which has this NAPA. It's fine if you don't want to. Obviously, you don't want to do business with the council, right? But you know things like, um, say we take, for instance, Fulton. Fulton Hogan. So, firms like Fulton Hogan, they've got people that supply fuel, tyres, engineers, accountants, lawyers, everything. Consultants, town planners, all those people will have to be registered, have um, NAPA in their organisation. That is how it will work. How we're going to monitor that is actually by um, maybe Survey Monkey chosen around the country. Maybe it could be Air New Zealand. They will have to, their staff will need to 
fill in the form. We're hoping to use AI, which is um, artificial intelligence, to find out what the trends are in the organisation. And so we, when we send this out from the Human Rights Commission, the staff of Fulton Hagen or Air New Zealand or the Salwan District Council, they will send it directly to the Human Rights Commission. The firm will not see it till there's a final report. And then we'll send the report to the Chief Executive and to the Board or the, the Council. All right? And that will give them some indication as to where they are sitting. If people don't wish to actually fill in this form, um, do the Survey Monkey, we will publish their name, name and chain. It's not much of a leverage, is it? Name and chain to say such and such a firm did not want to participate. And that means if they didn't participate, they, um, they will be deregistered from the GEX program. So you can't provide goods and services to the government. What do you reckon, Sean? That's a great idea. <laughs> so this is, um, I mean, this part here is sort of like um, local government DNA. How we um, actually, if you want, how we actually um, work with um, our communities. Um, you go out to your communities, no preconceived ideas, everybody has a contribution, they make it, and then the staff come up and summarises it all, and then we go back to the community and say, what do you reckon? This is how much this costs, this costs, this costs. Oh, can we take this out because our rates might go up? All right? And some people do make um, decisions that way. Now, in a community, it's sort of like home. If you want to be treated the way that you want to be treated, treat people in the community the way that you want to be treated. It's quite simple. And it doesn't take long for um, us to get on and our disabilities uh, come before us. And sometimes we are so vulnerable that we do need caring people in our society. And I'm always good to children. Because I know one day they might be looking after me in the rest of them, right? So be nice to children. And, um, and that bullying is such a big thing. Because bullying happens in schools. Obviously, why do we actually concentrate in schools? Because that's the only place where there is um, societal control, organisational control. You can't control people at home. People do say, oh, all this sort of stuff should start at home. Yeah, for sure. If it happens, it's great. But school is the next only control place. For, from five years to 17, 18 years, you want to do it, they can be controlled. Unfortunately, if you don't arrest the issue at school, it continues to university, tech college, business. Now, in the public sector, publish, by the, um, by the union, 18% of the workforce complains about bullying. That's only, I reckon, half. Because if you complain, it is not cool, job limiting, salary limiting, out. There's, there's not many people that actually complain and stay within that workforce. Because it actually is an interpersonal relationship that you have and suddenly watch out for them because they complain this. And so it's not a nice situation to be in. Not only in the workplace do uh, people get bullied, but those people actually carry it on to the rest home. So be mindful of the fact there are bullies. Even though people are older, they actually bully in the workplace. And so our... This plan here is not only for general society, but it's really also aimed at government. Because government situation is, is actually quite difficult. And I don't know why um, it's just difficult. It's a nice working environment, and, but there are bullies. But the bullies actually come from the families. I'm told um, the first three years of one's a child's life, if we can get that stimulated and taught how to do things for their children, it'll be a great start because there's a Chinese saying that 
the three-year-old will determine what an 80-year-old is going to be. And some other biblical things, it's seven years of your life and it determines what the man or woman is going to be doing in the future. In one area, who, who deals with um, antenatal or midwife, mid midwifery or something like that? Yeah. I think it would be good to teach mums how to do their, um, their first three years. It's a good start because we don't do it. All we need to teach them is actually, um, you know, how the body's going to react and breastfeeding and changing and going to um, plank it and all that sort of stuff. But to have the parents or the caregivers or nanny or anything to actually even just start reading to the kids uh, at that very young age um, and care for them and not traumatise them is very important. Unfortunately, um, my disabilities commissioner tells me that there are 3,000 children born each year with fetal alcohol syndrome um, issues. That is huge. 3,000 in 10 years, that's 30,000. And unfortunately, their bodies and minds and actions don't change because they're damaged through alcohol. <coughs> Any questions? I sort of gambled on a few things. And, yeah? Is there any please note that so at least on the accessibility, we decided an accessibility charter 18 months ago, which means that as we build new stuff, we review it in an external review for accessibility, and, um, and we're working quite strongly in that area. Our new Tela Atira, our new library, is going to have a um, sensory garden associated with it. Which we designed, we had worked with um, Waikaha School to design that. So we're, we've been driving that. We had the same issue with footpaths and manageable curves some years ago and um, have gone a similar way of, of, of making, trying to make our townships and our communities more accessible because it seems to be my observation in the aquatic centre is the best place for looking at it. When you put a ramp in Stetson, 90% of people disabled or able use the ramp. Yeah, it sort of makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Uh, how can um, people contribute and provide feedback to that task force? Yeah, sure. Um, what's going to, well, I'm just setting it up at the moment. Um, I've bought personally a program called Doodle. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. It cost me a few dollars. Um, the trick was. It was a lifetime subscription, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, right, 67 bucks. Clicked. That's 97 American, that's fine. And then it says, if you want this, this, and this, you've got to pay for this, this, and this. <laughs> so I ended up spending about 400 bucks. But if you have a look on um, the YouTube, Doobly, D-O-O-D-L-Y, right? Um, it will draw out and speak this as I say it. And it will have the links there and um, we'll share it on social media, Instagram, um, the modern mediums of communication and hopefully it goes out to thousands. But even like the CTU at 170,000 members, even if we had half of the uptake and they, each of those people actually shared it on social media, you might get another one or two, and they share it on. It's actually quite powerful. And so um, it'll be another month, I reckon. Um, I just found out that it doesn't actually work on my iPad in terms of designing the, the doodly, right? I might have to get onto a um, PC, uh, Windows or Mac or iOS. Yeah. What was one of the asking the mate was, with gets in requiring this for businesses, a problem we get, well certainly an issue has been, I think that's, the, is the cost of the very small businesses that um, help health and safety stuff when it was brought in and councils require small businesses to have health and safety plans before they could get um, business with council, work from council, was really in a, 
you know, we got a lot of kickback, lots of pushback saying that it was an imposition and a cost and didn't actually generate any income for them. Is this going to be another layer of what they're going to put, say, is simply bureaucracy imposed upon them that's not going to generate any income for them? Let me say this. If you ever have dysfunction in your family, you're likely to end up with half a house. All right? Simple. I'll let you know a stat. 11,000 people, couples, actually get married each year. Or in, yeah, they actually get married. You can all get married now. 7,000 a year actually separate. That is a huge stat. Right? Now, the cost to an organisation, it has to go through um, disturbance, what is it? Uh, personal grievance or something, PGs, right? It's costly. That's the cost. If you have harmonious workplace, production is going to go up. Right? It's just simple. Um, the bottom line is going to look much better and your organisation um, will buzz. The thing about um, social licensing now, you know, um, Green organisations, Eco, Organics, the Heart Foundation, Tick, uh, belonging to this ethical thing and that ethical thing. It's very mod modern now. My my children, um, my son runs a campground. He said, "Dad, I don't want you to be part of it because you are different thinking to me, right?" They are thinking about social license, ethical behaviour, long-term stuff, how they behave, and that's how the world is nowadays. We're choosing differently. People don't mind paying a little bit more for ethics, ethical products. Um, if you knew that there was still slavery, um, people picking coke, um, cocoa beans or pods, and uh, coffee, you'll think twice, right? And, 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 it's, and there's a lot of name and shame nowadays. You, you end up in the news. Um, suddenly, I think the Jemima, um, somebody that, that makes um, these uh, pearl rice things, they've had Jemima for 123 years as their brand with a uh, black negro lady um, presenting there. They've actually changed the name just just now, and they've called it something pearl. Um, we 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 used to have Eskimo things. We didn't know that it was um, insulting to the Inuit people in the northern hemisphere. But there's no Eskimo things now. They've changed it. So the ethics of our country, of our world, is actually changing quite fast. And if you're not on the run. You may not have business. Simple as that. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. I'm just wondering, so we've got Human Rights Commission, Disability Rights Commission, Race Relations. Should there be a Māori <laughs> Commission as well? Yeah, we have actually asked the government for that. Um, there is actually in, in our statute. And I don't know why they haven't filled it. Yeah, you yeah, bang on. Okay. Yeah, we have asked. Several times. In actual fact, the the national government was going to appoint somebody. They even advertised, they even shortlisted, but didn't appoint. Politics. <laughs> yes. Hey, um, I was just wondering about how young people can be involved in this process. Um, yes. I've got um, on my task force there's one young person. There's only about seven people. And so um, definitely schools, um, student unions, um, student councils, right throughout the universities, um, overseas student councils, they can all contribute, yeah, definitely. We've got a good database where we can also, with the ethnic communities, which we share same friends, because a lot of this consultation stuff can be quite tiring because we're calling upon our community quite often. And how I do my um, consultation 
Um, in Gisborne, I used, we've got 33,000 people in the city, and we have a meeting, and 10 turn up. And 10 people have a say in the whole district plan, the whole uh, long term plan. Hopeless, right? So I said, no, we're not going to have any of those meetings now. I am going to ring up U3A, Rake Street, the Student Council, um, Board of Trustees, a few. And I said, can I have 10 minutes of your time at your meeting? Can I be on your agenda? And then after the first year, they said, you can be on our agenda for a whole hour. And so it went from about 15 minutes to an hour. And so then I have maybe 500 or 1,000 people participate because we are just meeting out. We just don't have time. We don't have time to go. But because you belong to a social club, you belong to the rugby club, or a sporting organisation, or a business club like the Chamber of Commerce, I ring up the president, can I have half an hour? Not a problem. Come in, we're looking for people to talk. Right. So that's how we do it in our place. Great, thanks Thank very much. Yeah, I, I'm excited by the, um, I didn't need to parent for three years, because um, my daughter's <laughs> fourth birthday is uh, in about two weeks' time, so it's chopped up. Uh, <laughs> actually, the Brainwave Trust does a magnificent job of talking about brain development, and pre-parenting, it was great to go to that and actually hear about brain development, and uh, Billy, Billy three year old, so good to know the technique. I just want to read you a little bit from, um, it's a crown apology uh, to Naitahu, because I was thinking, connects in here, and sorry how much you've heard me say this twice in two weeks now, um, but I love the hope that you have displayed here, uh, and that there's a plan, and there's some action, and let's get on and do it, because it just seems so sensible that we wouldn't have already done this, it's, it's like frustrating that this is still an issue for our society, and we think how far we've progressed in a number of things, and yet racism is still, this, this simple way we treat each other still isn't right, um, really frustrating. Um, but this is a translation from the original Māori and the Apology to Naitahu, 1998. The Crown recognises the protracted labours of the Naitahu ancestors in pursuit of their claims for redress and compensation against the Crown for nearly 150 years. I'm like, ah, 150 years! How long do you have to fight to try and you know, get something put right that was so obviously wrong when we look back at it? And the last two sentences go on to say, the Crown apologises to Naitahu for its past failures to acknowledge Naitahu Rangatira Tanga and Mana over the South Island lands within its boundaries. In a fulfilment of its treaty obligations, the Crown recognises Naitahu as Tanga Nafenawa of and as holding Rangatira Tanga within the Takiwa of Naitahu Whanui. Accordingly, the Crown seeks on behalf of all New Zealanders to atone for these acknowledged injustices so far as that is now possible. And with the historical grievances finally settled as the metal set it out in the deed, 1997, to begin a process of healing and to enter into a new age of cooperation with Naitahu. And I think, me, what you've shown us here today um, is, is coming up, you're, you're a man of action. You know, this is great, you've been put into this role uh, and you're wanting to see healing in our nation uh, and a new age of cooperation amongst people. Uh, which just really feeds into the heart here, which even this is 22 years ago, you know, frustrating in 22 years. Uh, but great, great to see what you're doing here. Just want to encourage you uh, in that and from Selwyn District's point of view, want to engage in your process. Uh, and if there's a way that we're able to share that within our community and between our schools, um, really want to opt into that. So let's just give them a big hand.